Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. Please visit our website, cscatlanta.org, for a complete list of live and recorded events. We invite you to sign up for our newsletter to stay connected to all future programs. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today for this nutrition seminar. This is Emily Brown, the Program Director at Cancer Support Community Atlanta. Thank you for joining us for today's nutrition seminar on lifestyle recommendations for reducing the risk of reoccurrence in cancer prevention with Kristen Kukulowski. Kristen does these programs for us every month. Um, we're so grateful for her doing this for us. So without further ado, I will let you take over, Kristen. Thanks, Emily, and welcome, everybody. Um, so like Emily said, I'm Kristen. I am our oncology nutrition coordinator here at Northside Hospital. Um, and just to give a general disclaimer at the beginning of all of our presentations, these are more for a general audience. Um, it is hard to do more individual one-on-one -on -one recommendations. Um, so if something doesn't sound right to you or for your health or where you're at on this journey, that is okay. You might just need to talk to a dietitian one-on-one -on -one versus being part of this group-like setting. Um, and here at Northside, we do have dietitians that service all of our cancer clinics. And if you are outside of Northside at some of the other major um, hospital systems throughout Atlanta, they also have dietitians on staff. So if you need help getting in touch with somebody, we are here to help you with that. Uh, but today's topic is going to be on reducing the risk of recurrence and also cancer prevention. Um, so the same suggestions for both or the same recommendations for Preventing cancer are also um, in line with helping to reduce our risk of recurrence of cancer. So we will be going through some of those today. Um, our goals for this presentation are to discuss what the American Institute of Cancer Research's top 10 recommendations are um, for prevention and risk reduction. And then also, hopefully, you will be able to select a few of the recommendations to implement within your own lifestyle and where you're at in your cancer journey um, to help support your health goals. So who is the AICR? So it is the American Institute for Cancer Research, and they are part of the World Cancer Research Fund. Um, and they are responsible for funding research focused on nutrition, physical activity, and cancer prevention, treatment, and survival. Um, so they've got a global presence, but then they also have their arm that's here in just um, America. So they help to interpret results of research findings from a global scientific community, but also more local as well, and you'll see some um, maybe differences throughout the presentation, but they're really using evidence-based recommendations for lowering cancer risk. So a lot of people will ask me what my opinion is on certain things, and for nutrition and as a dietitian, we don't just go off of our opinions. We really try to focus on what the evidence says and what science is showing at the time um, to give you the best and latest information that's available on what is helping and harming and is considered safe and not safe regarding nutrition. So back in 2018, the AICR published their most recent expert report, um, and it's just titled Diet, Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Cancer, A Global Perspective. Um, you can Google that. It's a several hundred page document, uh, but they were able to narrow down about 10 recommendations for us. So around 40% of cancers that are here in the U.S. are considered preventable based on people's lifestyle choices. And again, they came up with those 10 key diet, nutrition, physical activity recommendations to help reduce cancer risk. So that's both cancer prevention and reducing risk of recurrence. So this slide's just gonna go over the top 10 and then we're gonna dive into them a little bit deeper. So the number one recommendation outside of not smoking and wearing sunscreen is to be a healthy weight. And we're gonna talk more about what that actually means later in the presentation. We should all be physically active if we can be. Eating a diet that's rich in whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and legumes. Limiting consumption of fast foods and other foods that we know are high in fats, starches, or sugars. And then limiting the consumption of red meat and processed meats. Limiting consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages. 
limiting alcohol consumption, not using supplements for cancer prevention, for mothers, breastfeeding your baby if you can, and then after you've been diagnosed with cancer, following these recommendations if you're able to. So just keep those in mind as we go through. Like I said, we're going to go um, more in depth into each one of those. So maintaining a healthy body weight. It is important to manage our weight for a number of reasons. Um, so again, like I said, next to not smoking, maintaining a healthy weight is one of the most important things that we can do for our overall health, but also reducing our risk of cancer. And body fat is actually active, so sometimes people just think it's just like there on our bodies and it's just not doing anything, like it's just, you know, there. But it actually acts as a hormone pump, so it can release things like insulin, estrogen, and other hormones in our body that can spur cancer growth. And then being a healthy weight also reduces your risk for other chronic diseases. So you definitely don't want to get through cancer treatment only to develop another kind of chronic illness down the road. Um, we want to prevent that if we can. So I get a lot of questions like what, you know, define what a healthy body weight is. And for a long time we use the BMI or body mass index, but more and more these days we know that that is really not an indicator for how healthy somebody is or how healthy of a weight somebody is at. Um, so it's more about your body composition. It's also about being, feeling good at the weight that you're at um, and something that you can maintain more easily. So if you're always yo-yo dieting or cycling up and down, you keep losing the same 15 pounds over and over again, maybe finding a middle ground in there um, that you feel healthy at and that you're able to maintain without having to do extreme things um, could be a good example. But we also want you to be strong, like we want you to have good muscle mass. Um, and so that's where some of the physical activity comes in. So there are thin people who have poor or low muscle mass, they're not very strong. Um, they can't get up and down very easily. Maybe I, a friend of mine this weekend was like, can you get out of a bathroom stall if you are trapped inside? And I'm like, oh, I don't know if I can climb out of a bathroom stall. I don't know if I'm that strong or not. Um, so it's, you know, when I think about it, it's can you get up and down comfortably out of your chair? Can you get up and down your stairs at home? Are you able to do the things in life that you want to be able to do um, as far as your stamina and being able to tolerate walking and getting around? Um, so just keep those things in mind when you think about a healthy weight because sometimes people get on certain maintenance drugs and they just have a difficult time losing actual weight on the scale. Um, but maybe you are working out and you've noticed that your pants are big and so you've lost inches, but maybe you didn't lose weight, and that's most likely because you've built some muscle um, and you have more lean body mass. So don't get too tied up in the number like that's on the scale. And I know that that's very hard. We've spent a lifetime thinking that way and believing that kind of thing, um, so it is hard to kind of shift that mindset a little bit. Oh, I had one more bullet point. It also prevents disease-related complications. So if you already have some chronic diseases, being a healthy weight or, um, you know, having more of that muscle mass and less of the fat mass can also help um, – with those disease-related complications. So when I think about this, I think about diabetes and how well-controlled maybe your diabetes is. Um, so you're not going to experience as many complications down the road um, as years go by. So being overweight or obese, and this is in relation to BMI, and that's really all they looked at. They didn't necessarily look at the overall health of uh, what was going on, but it has been linked to these, I think there's 12 cancers down the left-hand side, so it ranges from anything from breast cancer, colorectal, endometrial, esophageal, gallbladder, kidney, liver, uh, mouth, pharynx, and larynx, ovarian, pancreatic, prostate, and stomach cancer. And some of the causes of about weight gain and overweight and that lead to um, obesity is because as a society, we've really decreased the amount of time that we spend walking around. Like we drive a lot. It's super hot right now um, here in Atlanta, so it's hard to get out and about and to be active. Um, we're also just not doing a lot of physical activity. Um, we have diets that are lower in fiber. And we also just have a Western diet pattern um, that's not very um, heavy in fruits and vegetables and whole grains. So we're going to talk about that. And then there's also a decreased number of people that have been breastfed. 
Um, and then we have in the, our society uh, that increase in Western diet where it's very much large pieces of animal protein and higher fat, uh, fast foods. We spend a lot of time on screens. Um, Sugar-sweetened beverages have been a problem. And then for kids, also a lot of screen time. And sometimes you can't avoid that. You know, I work all day in an office. I'm here eight hours. I'm staring at a computer now as I give this presentation. Um, so it's really about limiting that once you're home, um, if you're not able to avoid it because, you know, we're adults and we have to work. All right, so walking more, sitting less. And I've heard people say sitting is the new smoking. I don't know how true that is, but we do sit a lot. Again, I'm here for eight hours. I sit in an office. Um, so you have to definitely make an effort to be uh, more active. So regular physical activity helps to support a healthy immune system, reduces chronic inflammation, helps your body maintain those healthy levels of hormones like your insulin and your estrogen. And over a longer period of time, it's going to help you to maintain that healthy weight that you're striving for. So I do get a lot of people who ask, you know, what do I need to take or what do I need to eat to support my immune system or boost my immune system? And we always overlook the, the basics, which would be having that physical activity on a regular basis. So just keep that in mind um, when you're thinking about your immune system as well. And then walking more, being more physically active has been directly shown to help protect against breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and endometrial cancer. Um, so that's some extra good news. And the current recommendations are to aim for at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity, moderate intensity physical activity per week. So that's about 30 minutes for five days a week. Um, so very doable. It doesn't all have to be done at the same 30 minutes. If you have to break it up um, throughout the day and do 10 minutes here, or 10 minutes there, that's perfectly fine. Um, and people often ask, like, what's moderate intensity? So I think about this with, like, the talk test. So if you're out walking with a neighbor or a friend, you should still be able to have a conversation with them but maybe you can only complete like a sentence and then you need to kind of breathe and keep going. So you should be able to say words and sentences, but your heart rate should be up and you should have a little bit of difficulty where, you know, you feel like you're breathing a little bit heavy. Um, but anything like walking, jogging, biking, playing tennis would count. Uh, stuff like yoga, resistance exercise is very helpful. Um, they do what Tai Chi here, some other fun stuff through the cancer support community that you can get into um, virtually and in person. And if you haven't worked out in a while or been physically active, you definitely start small. It all counts. So even if you can only do five minutes up and down the hall, that's fine. You just have to start somewhere, and the hardest part is actually getting started. Spacing it throughout the day. So again, if you have a busy, packed day or you're up at the infusion center getting treatment for several hours, you might have to space it out um, so you're not doing all the things at once. Or if you get fatigued really easy, you're going to have to really build yourself back up to get to where you want to be, and that's perfectly fine. You can add in walking and standing breaks to help limit your time sitting. So I've got a watch. It goes off on the 50th minute of every hour to remind me to stand if I haven't stood that hour, um, which I think is sad that I can't remember to get up and go walk around. But you just get so involved and so excited about working on something or watching a favorite TV show that you might have to have that reminder. So there is no shame in setting a, an alarm or an alert uh, to remind you to get up to make sure you're not sitting down for too long. And then trying to limit your screen time down to less than two hours. So again, we already kind of talked about this where that might not be conducive for a lot of people's lifestyle, but once you get home in the evening, if you're able to cut down on the TV time or scrolling on social media, that gives you more time to be physically active. So it's not just about just sitting there and watching the screens, but it's about what else can you be doing with that time um, if you get sucked into binge watching shows like I do on the weekends. Um, you just want to use caution there and try to stick down to the two hours or less. All right, next up is eating a diet rich in plant foods. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard 
uh, things like plant-based diet or plant-focused or plant-forward diet. And so that's really just meaning that we are focusing a lot on getting those plant foods on our plate and into our tummies. Um, so it can still include animal foods. Um, so it's not completely vegan or vegetarian, although that's perfectly fine if that's the route you want to take or are already taking. Um, but for a lot of us, it's just getting more fruits and vegetables and whole grains and beans into our diet. So um, I was at a conference two weekends ago, and somebody said that only 10% of the U.S., population actually gets the recommended daily fruits and vegetable recommended servings per day. So that's one in 10 people. Um, so we definitely have a lot of area and room to grow here. Um, and that survey was done in 2015, so it wasn't that long ago. So diets that are focused on plant foods can also help to reduce our risk of cancer. And they do that because plant foods have what we call phytonutrients or phytochemicals um, in them. And that is just um, a fancy term for the things that are additional to like vitamins and minerals. So phytonutrients are what gives the fruits and vegetables their different colors, um, their smell, their textures. They're just those extra components. And they're are thousands and thousands that haven't even been identified. Um, so we're still in the early stages of learning all of these phytonutrients and how they actually protect us. Um, but we do know in general that they protect the cells in our body from damage that can lead to cancer. Um, so that is super helpful. And then plant foods do tend to be lower in calories and higher in fiber, so they're going to keep you full longer um, because of that. But they're also you're not going to be taking in as much calories that can lead to being um, in excess and causing that weight gain. So they help us maintain that healthy weight. And then the current recommendation is to aim for two-thirds of your plate to be plant foods. So we're going to walk through kind of what that looks like in the coming slides. So this plate was put out by the American Institute for Cancer Research. They call it the New American Plate. I've got other plates that are going to come up after this, but this gives you a good idea of what we're talking about when it says two-thirds of your plate will be from plants. So you've got your carrots over here taking up a fourth. You've got some fun wild rice, we're going to call it here, up at the top, uh, which is also a plant food. And then you've also got some broccoli um, taking up the other fourth. I guess we're talking in thirds, but you get what I'm saying, two-thirds. And then you've got a small piece of animal protein. So um, it'll be a third of your plate or less. Um, so other things to kind of look at here, by focusing on having two different kinds of vegetables, but really four different kinds of foods on this plate, you've got a wide variety of things. So each one of these foods is going to give you a different vitamin, a different mineral. It's got some of them have fiber, some of them don't, um, and then it's got different phytonutrients to help protect you against cancer. Our protein serving is a modest three ounce serving. So I tell people three to four ounces. If you're a man, it might be four to five ounces. Um, but that's generally the size of the palm of your hand or the size of a deck of cards. Um, so if you think about the last time you went out to eat and you were looking at maybe ordering a steak or ordering a piece of fish, a lot of those servings are anywhere from like 10 to 14 ounces. So if you only need three to four ounces at a meal and they're already giving you 10 or 12, that's double to triple the size of protein you need at one setting. So just keep that in mind. So if you're in the boat of like, oh, I eat the whole thing that comes, uh, maybe thinking about having it and like just half it, take the other half home. Or if you're at home and you're preparing some of this stuff, it's going to give you a good idea of what you should have. And then the rest of your plate, that's going to free up space to add more vegetables and whole grains there for you. Having a variety of food, again, is important. Um, I know that a lot of people are single or live by themselves, or maybe there's only two of you there. Um, and so it can be a little bit more difficult to have that variety because you have to eat what you've purchased before it goes bad. Um, so just being mindful of that, it doesn't have to be all a variety all in one day. It can be throughout the week, um, or maybe one week you do 
you know, such and such vegetable, but the next week you pick a different color. Um, so just balancing it out throughout the course of time. There's no exact science to what you have to do. Um, it's just the more variety you can have, the more nutrients you're able to get in. And then again, two different kinds of vegetables on this plate, so that's just helping you get that variety. Um, so you might be like, Kristen, I only have like a whole head of broccoli. That's fine. If you can't get to the two vegetables at a meal, that's okay. Um, we all do the best we can. We're looking for progress and not perfection. Um, but because this plate has the two different kinds, you've got two different colors. So the carrots have certain phytonutrients that the broccoli doesn't have, and the broccoli has certain phytonutrients that the carrots don't have because they're different colors. Um, and that those colors help to make up that those those phytonutrients help to make up the different colors, sorry. And then always a healthy serving of a tasty whole grain. So when people tell me that they don't eat carbs or they've cut out carbs, it just hurts my heart because there's always a place on the plate for a healthy whole grain. Um, it's just about the serving size, which is about a half cup serving. Um, so again, we go a little heavy here in the Western culture on our portion sizes for grains, um, but just making sure that you do have those on your plate because they are a great source of fiber and they also have a lot of B vitamins in there that help with our metabolism. Metabolism. Um, it's just about not overdoing it. So this is kind of what a standard good old American plate looks like, or maybe used to look like for you. Uh, but you'll notice that you've got a larger piece of animal protein here uh, that's about an 8 to 12 ounce steak. You've got some mashed potatoes and then also some green peas. Both of those are starchy vegetables. Again, I don't think there are bad foods out there. It's just about the portion sizes, but we could definitely improve this plate um, based off of what we just learned about what they're recommending. So a good transition plate might look like this. So you've kind of cut down on the portion size of that steak. It's down to four to six ounces, so we've cut it in half. We've added um, some green beans, which are going to be a non-starchy vegetable, but it's one vegetable that's on this plate. And then we've got some fun seasoned brown rice over on the other third of the plate. So we're getting started on the right track here, but we can still improve a little. So this is more of what the new American plate might look like um, if you were following all of the guidelines that were on there. So you've got the three to four ounce serving of chicken here um, in the middle area, but then you've got all kinds of colors going on. So you've got some broccoli, you've got some tomatoes, you've got some zucchini, and then some bell peppers. So there's a lot of different variety, a lot of different kinds of vegetables, and they're taking up a good chunk of the plate. And then you've got a fun like quinoa, brown rice, mixture of some kind going on and about a half cup serving here. And then this is just another option of what that might look like, more as like a mixed up bowl. So I love bowls right now. I'm putting everything in bowls, whether it deserves to be in a bowl or not. Uh, but this is more of like a one pot meal. So it's got your chicken going on in here. There's some mushrooms, some broccoli, some carrots, and some onions um, for the vegetables. And then it's got like a base layer of some greens at the bottom. So still packed with nutrients, packed with those phytonutrients, phytochemicals. Um, you've got your protein, and then you've got your variety of different veggies going on. All right. So moving on to our limiting the consumption of fast foods. So these would be things that are higher in fat, starches, and sugars. Um, so a lot of our fast, like traditional fast food restaurants tend to fall in this category. A lot of convenience foods tend to fall in this category. Um, and again, it just says limit consumption. It doesn't say avoid altogether. Um, it's just being mindful that we are choosing other foods more often than we're choosing these. So limiting these kinds of foods will help control our calorie intake, and then in turn that will help to lead to a, a maintaining a healthy body weight down the road. And then there is strong evidence that consuming these fast foods or a Western-type diet are causes of weight gain, overweight, and obesity, which we know are related to at least those first 12 cancers that we talked about at the beginning. 
limiting red and processed meat. Um, so we'll spend a little time here, but for the red meats, that's anything like beef, pork, and lamb. A lot of times people argue about the pork part, um, saying it's the other white meat, but it's actually a red meat as well. Um, so pretty much anything that's livestock is gonna be considered red meat, including stuff like wild game, like venison, or is that right, venison, deer meat, bison. I had elk uh, back when I went out to Wyoming. So we can still have these foods. They just want to be um, limited to about 12 to 18 ounces per week. And actually a lot of people already limit their red meat consumption um, for heart risk factors. Um, so just you know, 12 to 18 ounces, that is quite a bit. That's two or three servings for the week. So if you are still having those foods or maybe you eat them more than often than you should, um, you know, knowing that you can cut down to two to three days per week versus cutting it out altogether um, will be much more successful. But evidence has linked red meat over 18 ounces to colorectal cancer. Um, so moderate amounts do not show a measurable increase in colorectal cancer, but when you start getting up to that 18 ounces and beyond for the week, that's when they start to see um, the increase in colorectal cancer for those patients. And then processed meats could be things like ham, bacon, hot dogs, salami, deli meats. And there's actually no safe amount that they recommend us have like they do for the red meats. Um, so for the processed meats, they actually um, suggest avoiding those if you can. And they do have a higher um, risk of cancer even at very low consumptions. So again, if you go out to the Braves game and that's your annual hot dog, like you just have to know that it might have an effect on your health and it might not. We don't really know a whole lot if you're only doing, you know, one hot dog per year. Um, but if you're regularly adding these foods in, just use caution um, and know that it could be increasing your risk. So we talked a little bit about this. So eat no more than moderate amounts of the red meat. So again, beef, pork, lamb, and then eat little if any processed meat. So ham, bacon, salami, hot dog, sausage. And I know a lot of people are like, what am I supposed to eat for breakfast? And sometimes you just have to get creative if you like to have some of these breakfast meats in the morning, um, switching over to eggs or things like turkey breast or chicken. I mean, just because it's not a breakfast food, quote unquote, traditionally doesn't mean you can't have it at breakfast. Um, you can eat whatever you want to for breakfast. It's fine. Limiting sugar-sweetened beverages or sugar-sweetened drinks, um, so leaning more towards mostly drinking water and those unsweetened beverages um, is preferred for your hydration. Um, Sugar-sweetened beverages provide energy but not influence our appetite. So if you had this milkshake, you might not really feel full. You probably will still feel hungry after it, so you've had a lot of calories, um, but you're not satisfied or you're not full. Um, and so that can lead to us having too many calories over the course of the whole day. Um, so it's not to say you can't have some every once in a while, but we just want to be mindful if we're doing it regularly. It's not really... Um, satisfying our appetites and so we're going to keep eating um, until we're feeling full. And there is strong evidence that consuming the sugar-sweetened beverages also can lead to weight gain, overweight, and obesity. So we do get the question a lot about sugar feeding cancer um, and what that influence is and there's actually no relation to sugar directly causing or feeding cancer, um, but we do know that with this weight gain or being overweight that it can lead to other types of cancer. Um, and so that's really where this recommendation comes in. It's not that the sugar is going to cause the cancer or the sugar is going to feed cancer. Kristen, we had a question in the chat. Is it just the nitrates in processed foods? I wish I could... <laughs> Uh, say for sure all of it, but this quite, can you turn your microphone off? Okay, sorry. Um, so it is partially the nitrates and the nitrites, and if you have those foods that say that it does not have nitrates or nitrites, I just encourage you to also look at the fine print on the packaging, because a lot of them do have a disclaimer that says that there's naturally occurring nitrates or nitrites in the preservative that they've used. Um, but it's a combination of the curing and the processing that the meats 
tend to go under, um, that can also lead to some of those cancer-causing agents too. And even the ones that are naturally occurring in the other preservatives have been shown to have the same effect on cancer risk. So just because it says no nitrates or no nitrites, um, if it does have that disclaimer, I would just use caution with those two. Can you give an example of how to have a plant-based plate for breakfast? A what plate? Plant-based. Um, yes, so I mean, it kind of just depends on what kind of plant-based thing that we are talking about. So I am a huge fan of smoothies in the morning uh, because I'm on the go. So I like to throw in half a frozen banana and half a cup of berries that are like a variety pack. And then I use a whey protein powder and I've used cow's milk, but other people use almond milk or you know, soy milk, whatever your preference is. And then um, I throw in some chia seeds for good extra fiber and also some healthy fat in there as well. Um, so if you're like a full vegan type plant-based diet, you would just use a plant-based protein powder and a plant-based milk alternative instead. Um, so that's an option you could do if you're doing eggs, you can always have like a really fun omelet that has tons of veggies inside and you can have a side of fruit. Um, you can do peanut butter toast if you're doing really simple basic stuff. Um, so hopefully that gave you some ideas there. Okay, this one is always a touchy subject. So limiting alcohol consumption. So for cancer prevention, it is actually best to not drink alcohol. So I know the American Heart Association says for heart health, if you do drink, that it's okay to have two drinks per day for men and one drink per day for women and that it can help lower your risk of heart disease um, if you already drink. But they don't recommend starting to drink if you don't drink just for heart health um, by any means. But we know that alcoholic beverages increase the risk of at least six cancers, um, and those are your mouth, pharynx, and larynx cancers, esophageal cancers, breast cancer, liver cancer, stomach cancer, and colorectal cancer. So again, previous research showed that modest amounts of alcohol may have those uh, protective effects on our heart disease, um, but alcohol in any form is actually a very potent carcinogen. So it doesn't matter if it's beer or red wine or a liquor, um, it's the ethanol that's in the alcohol that is actually the carcinogen. And then once your um, liver metabolizes the ethanol inside your body, it creates a byproduct um, that I can't remember the exact name and I'm not good at pronouncing it anyway, but it creates another carcinogen after it's metabolized as well. So for those who are concerned about cancer, the recommendation is to not drink. Um, but if you do drink alcohol, still limiting that consumption to the one drink for women or the tr uh, two drinks per day for men. So that's a personal choice. You have to decide um, what you want to do and how it affects your quality of life. And that is all I know on this subject here. And then, is that a question for us? Ask about the impossible burgers. What do you think about impossible products or Morningstar vegetarian products? Yes, so great question. Um, so the impossible burgers and Anything that kind of falls into that processed food category, which those are, and not all of them are. So there are different brands and different kinds of things, and even the same brands might have different products that they have released. So you're trying to look for foods that are the least processed. So the Impossible Burgers that I have seen, that does not mean I've seen them all, tend to be very highly processed. Like they have been made to taste really great um, and to really mirror what a a normal hamburger would taste like. Um, so for those, you just have to check the sodium content, 
looking at the saturated fat, looking at some of the other things um, that might be involved on the food label. But then you have other burgers that you can very clearly see are like black beans smushed together, and those are much less processed. So there's not a whole lot going on in those specific products. Um, or like Dr. Prager's is a brand that I've seen that like you can actually see like the chunks of edamame and stuff throughout like it's just you can tell it's just mechanically kind of pressed together versus something that's been added a lot of preservatives um, that might up that saturated fat and the sugar and the salt in those products so I don't know specifically about Morningstar per se um, but again I just check the double check the food label and whatever your health you know, you might not have a lot of issues with blood pressure, and if that's something that you just have every once in a while throughout the week, and it's a little bit higher in sodium, that's okay. Um, you just have to double check. There's so many products out there. It's hard to tell. All right, so this one really gets people tripped up, too. So do not use supplements for cancer prevention, meaning... My neighbor told me that I needed to take this supplement to prevent cancer or to do this. Um, so I just encourage to use caution and to make sure that your medical team knows what you're taking. And unless your doctor or your dietitian has told you that you have a deficiency in something or they want you to take something like calcium for your bone health, to just use caution and to make sure that you understand what the product is doing. Um, before taking it because even though they're quote unquote natural doesn't always mean that they're safe and that they're going to be healthy for you to be taking through your cancer journey um, because we know that some of those supplements can interfere with actual cancer treatments and um, cause side effects that maybe you weren't expecting and I have good examples of people being on certain supplements that have side effects that mimic cancer like chemotherapy side effects and like they've had to have their treatment paused um, because we thought they were having reactions to their chemotherapy when it was their supplement that they were taking um, so they skipped treatments and mistreatments um, so we just want to make sure that those kind of things aren't happening so for most people if you are able to eat a variety of different foods we can obtain adequate nutrition from a healthy diet and so I always tell people like you can't out, you can't supplement your way out of a bad diet. Like you have to have that foundation and go back to the basics, just like our physical activity. Um, so when it comes to cancer prevention, the research shows that supplements do not offer the same benefits as eating the whole food. And the panel that created all of these said that multivitamins are typically okay. Um, and then for specific supplements, it's based off of your population that might benefit from them. So as we get older, we know our bone health starts to um, decline. So that's when we start seeing your doctors recommend calcium and vitamin D. Um, so those things are a little bit different. I'm talking about some of these herbals and people taking high doses of zinc and vitamin C because, you know, cold season's coming up. And zinc actually blocks our absorption of iron and it blocks our absorption of copper over the long term. So you can start becoming copper deficient or iron deficient um, when you're taking a lot of zinc. So I know that's a popular one that's come out since COVID has started. Um, and it's just not meant to be taken for a long period of time. Even when we use it for stuff like wound healing, we typically limit it to like 30 to 60 days um, and reevaluate. And then we're also monitoring people's iron levels and usually their copper levels too. So again, you just want to make sure that your doctor knows what you're taking and to make sure that you're having your labs drawn um, to make sure that your body is tolerating those things and that you're not causing another problem down the road. <sighs> And for vitamin D, I always tell people, I'll just give you the little caveat. Please have your labs drawn to know what your vitamin D level is before you start taking a supplement because there are so many of them out on the market that it's so hard to tell if it's being effective or not. So one of my uh, previous dietitians, she was taking vitamin D under her doctor's care because she had a low vitamin D level. 
and it was a higher amount. It was like 5,000 international units per day. The recommendation is like 800 um, per day. So she was taking over the amount to help correct that low level. And she went back to the doctor. They tested it. She was in the normal range. They dropped her down to 2,000 international units per day. And by her next checkup, her vitamin D level was low again. And she was still taking the double recommendation. So she knew that she changed her supplement and her body just wasn't absorbing it as well um, or it wasn't enough for her. So you do have to know like what your levels are to really have a good read on if something is working for you. All right. So the moral of the story, it's always best to discuss any supplements that you're taking with your doctor and or your dietitian. Jen, when your BMI is really bad, are there certain food beverages to pile up in order to reduce the belly fat faster or more efficiently? So there are no quick fixes when it comes to our health. Um, I would have to know your exact specific situation to really give you those specific recommendations. But no, there's not anything specifically that has shown consistently. If you're thinking about like apple cider vinegar or some of those things, um, you know, there's a little bit of research out there, but there's not a whole lot of research. And it's also really important to know that your health is a lifetime of care. It's not 30 days. It's not two months. Um, it takes us a long time to get to where you're currently at, and it can take a long time to correct things. And it should. I mean, there are behavioral changes, and it just takes us a long time as humans to really make those changes so that they're sustainable and you're not um, just like crash dieting or doing things like that. Because what tends to happen is we start to lose some of our muscle mass when you're doing those crash diets. Um, you might notice that you feel more weak and fatigued and tired and irritable, and it could be because you're changing your body's composition and it's not just fat that you're losing um, so we want to make sure we're protecting our muscles and building our muscles while at the same time reducing our fat. Is beneficial? Yogurt can be beneficial, yes, if you like yogurt. Um, so I always prefer something more along the lines of Greek yogurt. It's got a higher amount of protein than a regular yogurt has. So, you, again, you just have to check the food label. Um, so I was eating a yogurt that only had like 4 grams of protein in it, where Greek yogurt has usually 12 to 15 grams of protein. Um, so that protein, again, helps to protect our muscle mass, but it also um, helps to keep us full a little bit longer and and it's usually not packed as much with those added sugars um, as some of the other more frou-frou yogurts are. And then, of course, they have those natural occurring probiotics um, that help with our gut health. Um, so, yes, I'm a big fan of yogurt if you like yogurt and tolerate yogurt. But if you hate yogurt, you do not have to eat yogurt. CLA can reduce belly fat. Is that true? I don't know what CLA is, if they can spell out what that is. Yeah, if you'd like to tell us what CLA is. How about how many eggs are recommended per week? Yes, yeah, so the good old egg debate. Um, so we went through a period of time where eggs were not good for our cholesterol. Um, can you turn your microphone off again? Sorry, you echo. Um, so it kind of varies. Some people eat them every day, but cholesterol that's in eggs is not linked to our personal dietary cholesterol like that gets um or dietary cholesterol does not influence like your human cholesterol that is drawn through labs um but the saturated fat that you find in the yolk can be linked to it so there's other good beneficial nutrients that come out of an egg yolk like it's um, vitamins and some other things that are in there so if you're doing whole eggs I usually do like one whole egg a day plus some egg whites to help boost up the volume of it because the egg whites don't have the saturated fat and that has been linked to the increase of cholesterol and then maybe a little bit of um, that inflammation that can happen okay 
so for mothers, breastfeeding your baby if you can, and then if you're past the time of being um, a young mother, then if you have kids or you have influence over mothers, just helping to be encouraging there if, they're, if this is what they want to do. It's their choice, but breastfeeding is good for both the mother and the baby. And there's strong evidence that breastfeeding helps to protect against breast cancer in mothers. Um, so it helps to lower the levels of some cancer-related hormones. And then at the end of breastfeeding, our bodies actually get rid of any cells in the breast that may have DNA damage. So it kind of does its own cleanse. And then for babies who are breastfed, they're less likely to become overweight or obese um, later in their adult life. So overweight and obese children tend to remain overweight in adult life as well. And then after a cancer diagnosis, follow these recommendations if you can. So again, this might not always be appropriate for everybody. Um, you may have had some surgeries during your treatment. You might not tolerate certain foods. Um, so we can always customize things for you, but implementing these cancer recommendations can improve your quality of life and then also help prevent a cancer recurrence. And then these recommendations are also very likely to reduce your intakes of salt, saturated fat, trans fat, which together will help to prevent other chronic diseases from forming. And then final thoughts are that you should aim to follow as many of these recommendations as you can um, that are possible. If you currently don't do any of them, then just start with one or two. You don't have to do a full 180 of your whole lifestyle overnight. Um, it's more about just starting picking one that seems more feasible to you. Um, if you're already following most of these, great job. Um, that's what we ask. And any changes that you make towards these recommendations are going to go some way towards reducing your risk for cancer. Um, so again, other lifestyle behaviors are not smoking and avoiding exposure to tobacco, and then also avoiding excess sun exposure and making sure that you're wearing your sunscreen. And if there are any extra questions, we can answer those. Yes, we welcome you to unmute yourself if you have a question for Kristen. We have a few more in the chat box that I will get to. How do vegans maintain an appropriate level of vitamin B12? So normally they'll have to supplement or they can use um, nutritional yeast. A lot of times they'll add that to different dishes. That is also a source of vitamin B12. But normally vitamin B12 is found in animal products, and so the best source for them um, is typically to supplement. And usually they have their labs checked as well just to make sure that they, whatever they're using is working for them. All right. I read that kiwis are cancer preventative, but I have, but have 10 grams of sugar per kiwi. I don't know if your mic is on because I don't hear you echoing, but the question was about kiwi and it being cancer preventative and but a kiwi having 10 grams of sugar. So when we think about the sugar piece for cancer prevention, it's really about the added sugars that we are limiting. Um, and for women, it's about 25 grams per day of added sugar. And for men, it's 38 grams per day. So added sugar is when something is added to a product. And a kiwi comes with its own natural sugar. So we don't worry about fruit sugars like we would if it was an added sugar in a processed food. So kiwis, I mean, any fruit or vegetable is going to be cancer fighting. So they're delicious. You should enjoy them while they're in season. And I do also recommend, sorry, I'll just say one more thing, um, that when you eat fruits, you should also pair it with something else. So if you're eating just a fruit that is more of a carbohydrate and does have the um, natural sugars in there, they also have some fiber. So that's going to slow down the digestion in your um, stomach. But if you pair it with something that maybe has protein, so maybe your yogurt or a handful of nuts, um, that's going to create more slow digestion and absorption. And so you're not going to see a spike in your blood sugars like you would if you just ate it by itself. And it'll help keep you full a little bit longer if you're using it as a snack. Or you can pair it on to something like your lunch as like a little side item.
So Splenda is a sugar alternative. So what they do with Splenda is they take a sugar molecule and they add a little piece of chlorine to the chemical structure and so our body can't absorb the Splenda. Um, so it's treated a little bit like fiber. Um, again, everything in moderation tends to be okay. It's like how much Splenda are you using? Is it just in your coffee in the morning? That's usually going to be okay. If you're just downing Splenda all day, we might have to look at, you know, what else is going on um, as far as sweet tooths go. But yes, I mean, it's fine if you're using it as, a, as an alternative to sugar, especially if you're managing something like your diabetes. Um, but there are lots of choices out there too. So Splenda's one, uh, some people, monk fruit is becoming very popular, stevia, um, so they all kind of fall in similar categories, uh, but some are like stevia is an actual plant that is sweet that they process and make it into a powdery white substance so it looks like sugar. And then monk fruit is usually partnered with like erythritol, and some people just do not tolerate erythritol very well. Um, it just depends on what your GI system is tolerating and doing. Yep, so honey um, by itself is, you know, naturally sweet. If you add it to something, it's considered an added sugar. Um, so it's very similar to table sugar. It's got a little bit of other nutrients in there because it's just slightly different, but our body recognizes it like it would be a sugar. I mean, again, it kind of just depends on like what you like to eat. So there are no like bad or like tragic foods. We can always add things in and have a little bit of something. But if you're regularly having sugar cravings, um, that might just be from your insulin levels and your blood sugars dropping after meals or after snacks. Um, and so there might be other strategies that you can deploy to help to reduce those cravings. But if it's like I've got a sweet tooth a couple nights a week and I just want a small bowl of ice cream because it's 100 degrees outside, it's about the portion size and how much you're doing. Um, I have some people that are like, oh, I was so bad. I just had a small square of dark chocolate. And I'm like, it's okay. That's not going to make or break your health. Um, so, you know, it just depends on what you like and take a couple bites, see how you feel and leave the rest. That is all the questions. Thank you, Kristen, so much for doing this presentation for us today. Kristen will be back next month on the third Tuesday of the month to talk about hydration, which is very important right now with how hot it's been outside. So go to our website, cscatlanta.org, to register for the next nutrition seminar. And like Kristen said, we offer plenty of exercise as well as our nutrition program. So if you're interested in some of these ways she talked about today in lowering your cancer risk, please check out all of the programs that we offer at CSC Atlanta. All right, thank you everyone for joining us today and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. If you're interested in other live or recorded programs, please visit the online program tab of our website, cscatlanta.org. Or follow us on Facebook. We'll be sharing additional information on upcoming programs.